Welcome everyone to the uh, CABRIN Friday afternoon webinar, Can Hybrid Cloud Security Posture Be Monitored by a Unified Score? Some people are still uh, joining the webinar, so we'll start in about 90 seconds, so please stand by. Welcome everyone to the uh, Cavern Friday afternoon webinar. Can hybrid cloud security posture be monitored by a unified score? Uh, we'll start in about a minute. Just as a reminder, uh, the slides and the actual webinar will be posted by Bright Talk on their platform within the next hour after the webinar. And also please come to our website for additional information. So welcome everyone to the Cavern Friday afternoon webinar. By the way, have a great uh, holiday weekend and holiday week if you're in the United States. Can hybrid cloud security posture be monitored by unified score? Presenters today include Anupam Sahai, who's our VP of uh, Product Management, great deal of background and domain expertise in cloud, SaaS, cybersecurity risk management as well as network security and analytics. And he's joined by Basha Manat, also on the PM team, a lot of deep uh, experience in machine learning, uh, data learning, and also uh, big data analytics. So Anupam and, and Basha, welcome to the two of you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anupam. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. So what, what we will cover today is shown in the agenda here. We'll talk about the problem statement, what, what is the big problem, the big picture issue that we're trying to address, and uh, how that gets complicated further by the hybrid cloud environment that, that we're talking about. And so that leads to the question about, so why do we need something like a cyber posture score? a unified score, and, and what is it? So we will define that, we'll describe the motivation for it, and describe what it is, and how, why, and why this is difficult to compute. And then we'll talk about a, a, a method or a process that's required to, uh, to not only understand the cyber posture, to calculate it, but to be able to use it effectively in your infrastructure. And all of this needs automation, so we'll talk about and show you a demo from Cavern as to what Cavern does and, and then talk about next steps. So let's get started. So let's talk about the problem statement. And uh, you know, if you look at the multiple surveys that are out there, you know, if you look at some of the cloud security related concerns, 60% of enterprises today are either extremely concerned or very concerned. And if you include the moderately concerned segment, you're looking at about 91% of organizations that are concerned about cloud security. And if you marry that statistics with, or, or take, take that stat in, in perspective, where about 80 to 85% of enterprises today have some kind of a hybrid cloud infrastructure, then the picture becomes very murky. And, and when we talk about hybrid cloud, we're talking about a combination of multi-cloud environments, a combi which includes uh, multiple cloud environments. It could include on-premises, data center related envi environments, and also Docker container related DevOps environments. So all of these mm -hmm. are included in the definition of uh, hybrid cloud and cloud security is, is a big challenge today. So what are the challenges? If you look at, again, some of the market pieces that's out there, 
you see the, the biggest three challenges are related to visibility into the security infrastructure, into the cloud infrastructure. Visibility because uh, some of the cloud instances could be dynamic. The applications and services used in the cloud infrastructure can, can vary. There are lots of services. And having the corporate IT person be able to be aware of what's going on in the cloud and, and be able to manage it, track it, and to ensure that the corporate compliance policies are adhered to and that no data is being uh, shared unnecessarily or that could cause breaches. So visibility, compliance, security, and, and being able to track applications that are, that are being used in the cloud, hybrid cloud environment are the key challenges. You can see the percentages there, and, and that pretty much sums up the picture there. So let's start, given, given the fact that this is a problem, so why the need for a score? So the many reasons can be, can be mentioned there, but basically what we're looking for is, is a measure of the health of the infrastructure. Just like you have a credit score, which tells you whether you're credit worthy or not, we're looking for a similar cyber posture score that essentially reflects the efficacy of your information security program. How secure is it? How risky is it? And, and, the, and the risk and security posture, compliance posture, will thereby enable you to understand where the problem areas are, what the top, top concerns are, and then you can measure, measure the efficacy to make sure that you're able to stand up against the common threats that might be prevalent at that point in time. And more importantly, you want to make sure that you have a program, an information security program, or your infrastructure is robust enough to, to, to be dealt with, to, to be able to deal with these ongoing threats and um, persistent threats, APTs, advanced persistent threats, that, that can change and morph with time. Another motivation is that you want to be able to report the cyber security status, the posture, to the board. Every quarter, the board would like to know Given the, the publicity around breaches that are happening very, very frequently, it's important and pertinent that you be able to quantify and report succinctly the current cybersecurity posture and, and thereby also measure yourself against the competitors. So all of this leads to the fact that as a, as a company, as an enterprise, you want to know where you are today and where are you headed which we call the golden posture, the target posture. And being able to manage that is very key to understanding and to solving and addressing the cybersecurity problems. So that brings us to the notion of risk analysis. So, and, and what risk analysis, I'll define the term risk uh, in, the, in the next slide, but think of risk analysis as a diagnosis process, a diagnostic process that gives you an estimate of where do you stand today? And, and essentially what risk analysis is doing is it's looking at weak links in the organization. The weak links could be related to technology. It could be related to people, related issues. It could be related to processes. And so in a holistic sense, risk analysis is giving you the ability to identify the weaknesses and thereby fix it. So the reason you want to do that is you don't want to get breached and you want to make sure that you are compliant with all the different regulations. And uh, the breaches, there's some stats out there that an average cost of a breach is about $3.6 million with about $141 per record breached. And to put this in perspective, in 2018, we've had about more than a billion records that have been breached. So you're talking about staggering amounts of money being lost as, um, as companies get breached, and it's very important to, to be able to understand and prevent that. The corporate compliance is another facet of risk analysis, where you want to make sure that you're complying with the corporate policies. Some verticals like healthcare have HIPAA requirements, retail e-commerce have PCI requirements, GDPR is, is pretty much required for every, every European entity or anybody who does business with them, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, the penalties there are, are huge. The, the penalties could be because of data lost. It could be because of 
consumers or patients coming after you in terms of lawsuits, or it could be governmental fines, or in the case of PCI, the credit card vendors may prevent you from doing any transactions. So the combination of security risk and compliance risk, if you add it together, adds up to the business risk. And that's a pretty large risk that needs to be managed properly. Otherwise, businesses can, companies can go out of business and, and essentially not be able to uh, survive and thrive. So let's talk about some of the definitions of risk. And, and risk in a holistic sense is, is oh, sorry, is talking about three things. It's looking at the risk is because of loss of data due to any threat that could adversely impact your operations or infrastructure. And if you want to narrow down the concept of risk to IT-related risk, it's really related to what we call the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information in the IT infrastructure so that it's not compromised. And if you are a, a healthcare entity or, or a web e-commerce e entity, you don't want your customer's information, proprietary information, or intellectual property to be compromised. So risk assessment is essentially the process of identifying, estimating, and prioritizing the information security risk. That's what we are after so that we can understand what is the current exposure level and take steps to fix the most important issue. So let's go. So having that background, the question is, how do I go about doing security risk analysis? And as a security, security domain, I've been in the security domain for the last 12 to 15 years. And one thing we can tell for sure is that there is nothing called foolproof security. There's nothing called 100% security. So, so in, that, in that respect, what we're trying to do is to figuring out the key assets and we're trying to figure out the key assets that are the most important to you that you want to protect. You want to figure out the most relevant threats for those critical assets, and then be able to deal with the, the threats so that they don't compromise your critical assets. So since we cannot deal with protecting all the assets everywhere, we have to figure out a risk-based approach where you focus on the most critical resources that you're trying to protect. And given the criticality, given the threat level, and the ability to detect and respond to these threats before they impact your critical asset, the, the other dimension that we need to worry about is how likelihood is that threat to cause the business impact that you're worried about. So these are the five different variables, as it were, the criticality of assets, the threat likelihood, and the, the impact of these threats and then the ability to detect and respond before the threats are compromised, are able to compromise your data. If you put this in perspective, this is a NIST framework that puts all these different five variables, and if you add the asset, it's a sixth variable. So you have threat sources, which are really threat actors, such as malware, such as it could be um, maybe a DNS um, malware, it could be the, the Spectre malware that hit, uh, hit us in January of this year, it could be ransomware, it could be any, any threat source that is essentially using a sequence of events, which uh, in the case of ransomware that we talk about could be an escalation of privilege or anything that compromises, allows you to compromise the, the IT assets. So threat sources are using threat events, a sequence of events, to exploit vulnerability, which are really weaknesses in the system. So it could be any, any weakness that could be exploitable by, by a threat event using, uh, using this vulnerability. And, and, and that causes adverse impact, which could be a business impact that could lead to, lead to organizational risk. And the combination of events can happen with a certain likelihood, certain probability. It doesn't happen always. It doesn't happen never. 
And so you, you have to figure out how often does this combination of events that can happen and what's the business impact for, for, um, for these sequence of events to take place, thereby causing critical impact on your business. Now the only thing that is preventing or protecting your critical assets against this sequence of events is your security controls, which may or may not be effective. And, and the security controls here could be, could be um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in terms of antivirus software, it could be in terms of configuration management software or vulnerability management, what have you. Anything that preve prevents or retards the, the, the threats from progressing or affecting your critical assets is considered to be a control. And there are different information security frameworks that recommend different kinds of controls. So at the end of the day, what we are after is the ability to figure out the up quantification of the risk, which is indicative of your cyber posture score. And, and we'll take you through the process that we do. But qualitatively speaking, what you're getting, getting after is a combination of, of risk values and qualitatively speaking, that, that those values range from low risk to, to very high risk. And there are grades in between, depending on the combination of likelihood and impact that affect the critical assets. So our next set of slides are going to talk about how do we take this qual qualitative quantification and turn it into a, a quantifiable version of the risk measure. So I will hand it, hand it over to now Bashem to take you through. Oh, sorry, I have one more. So before I turn it over to Bashem, and now we talked about the risk framework. Now, another complexity that's involved is because of the nature of the hybrid cloud. And hybrid cloud brings in its own set of challenges with respect to scale in terms of the dynamic nature of resources. So in terms of the scale, you're looking at different types of resources, which might be spread across your enterprise, across multiple cloud environments, or in your Docker container environments, or traditional data center related uh, virtual machines and operating systems. You have the dynamic nature of these resources, where containers could come and go, and an average life, lifespan of a container is two, about half to two days. Average life of a cloud instance is about two weeks, and, and depending on the use case, it could be as, as uh, low as a few days. So given that these, these resources are, are uh, very dynamic, and, and, and there's a lot of data flowing back and forth in this enterprise cloud infrastructure, so there's a high volume and high velocity with dynamism included, it makes the problem of estimating and coming up with, with a cyber posture score much more harder, and, and to be able to quantify this is much more harder. So I will just say this, that what, what is a cyber posture score? It's a score between 0 and 100. Higher the score, better it is. And it's essentially quantifying the overall posture risk. And the risk contributing factors, as we talked about, are multiple factors. There are, there are configuration issues that one needs to worry about the vulnerability issue that one needs to worry about, the control framework related audit requirements. So if you have compliance requirements, PCI, HIPAA, SOC 2, GDPR, they also need to be measured and assessed. And, and of course, asset criticality, threat intelligence, likelihood and impact, all of these are factors that contribute to quantifying risk. And, and the challenge that the cyber posture score methodology faces is that in a dynamic environment, how do you go about doing this where you're dealing with scale, you're dealing with variety, you're dealing with high velocity, and, and lots of data. So to provide an assessment of score in this dynamic environment is, is the key challenge that we are solving. And I will hand it over to Bhashim now to take you through the process that, that um, is, is a sample example. Go ahead, Bhashim, please. Hey, thanks, Anupam. So uh, in the next few slides, what we want to do is you know, operationalize the framework that uh, Anupam has been describing. So before we do that, I wanted to highlight how hackers work. And then the flip side of hackers is really 
you know, the controls and the security posture that you actually have in place, right? So in, in this particular example, you have the WannaCry ransomware attack that was fairly well, uh, uh, it, it broke out last year, during the middle of last year. And if you think about, you know, how hackers work typically, they, the first thing that they do is to figure out what resources uh, they can actually attack. So they're actually doing reconnaissance on your infrastructure, if you will. The second thing that they do is uh, figure out a exploit that they can actually go against the vulnerability or weakness in your infrastructure. That's sort of the second step. So in the case of the WannaCry attack, there's basically one particular port that was public facing and which a lot of uh, a lot of the victims had left open. And as part of reconnaissance, some of these threat actors had actually found that the port was actually indeed open. But then more importantly, there was, as, as it relates to vulnerabilities here, there was actually a flaw in Windows which allowed someone to enter through that port and then launch a lateral movement, if you will, into other machines in a given network, right? So that's the Windows vulnerability itself that is part of the story. And the second vulnerability, again, was leaving those ports open in the first place, right? So those three factors combined with the fact that uh, these, these, these threat actors were actually able to launch, you know, create a ransomware that actually exploited those two vulnerabilities, get into the network, and do a lot of damage, right? So the idea here is that, you know, finding out resources that are out there, which are then subject to a threat. A threat in this case is a set of people that had a ransomware created against a certain set of vulnerabilities, in this case, a bunch of software flaws along with ports that were open in, 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 in a given network. And uh, the flip side of vulnerabilities is the missing controls, if you will. And those combination of circumstances essentially resulted in breach uh, for a number of uh, consumers and businesses, if you will. And the last but not least, from an impact perspective, in this particular case, it is really, uh, in this case, the ransomware didn't actually destroy any data but it made the data unavailable. So when it comes to the CIA rating, it's the unavailability of the data and the resources. That's really the, the, the biggest impact that a lot of these customers faced. Now having said those, again, the, having talked about those six criteria or dimensions of risk, if you will, what, what, what does a framework look like for actually creating a cyber posture score? Right? So the, again, pretty much mapping to how hackers work. Again, this is also inspired by NIST like uh, Anupam was describing, the first step is actually discovering resources no matter where they are, right? In our framework, it's about discovering a set of hybrid resources in three different clouds along with Docker containers and on-premises infrastructure in the form of VMware, if you will. That's the first step. The second step is actually assessing threats. Threats is, again, it's a combination of threat events that are perpetrated by a bunch of threat actors, if you will. And we talk about, for each of these steps, we talk about where do you actually, where might you actually get the data and how do you actually put it together in a score, if you will. Vulnerabilities, again, it's a combination of software flaws that you need to be aware of, as well as configuration weaknesses, if you will. Controls are really things that you have in place or defenses that you have in place against those software flaws. So typically, it's either applying patches that the software vendors have put out or making sure that you check for your configurations and then block, plug any holes that you may have in your configurations, if you will. Uh, and then putting all of these together, you have to come up with a notion of likelihood. This is how likely is a given threat or threat event, how likely is it to be successful. That's what you're trying to estimate. And on the impact side, it's, uh, it's ultimately driven by uh, you know, a loss of availability, a loss of integrity, or uh, breach of confidential data, which again you're trying to uh, uh, to estimate. The problem with this framework, uh, although it is a good framework to lay out what are the things that you should keep in mind, the net effect is that it requires a lot of quantification and a lot of data, and that's the part that has historically been left unaddressed by organizations like NIST, and that's something that uh, Kevin has actually taken a first crack in terms of coming up with a framework to put numbers on it, if you will. So, and, and in the next few slides, I, I'll take you through each of the steps and see where you might actually get the data. So as it relates to a resource or asset discovery, as you can see on this slide, uh, across the three clouds that are listed here, across VMware and Docker containers, there's roughly, uh, you know, of the order of 50 to 60 different types of resources that you would have to keep, 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 uh, keep track of. 
right? So back to what Anatom was saying a little bit earlier, there is an enormous variety when it comes to hybrid clouds in, 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 the, uh, in the kinds of assets and resources that are representing your attack surface, if you will. Uh, unlike maybe five years ago, where primarily you're dealing with a bunch of physical machines and virtual machines, the landscape today has over, depending on how many clouds we've adopted, you're looking at anywhere from 50 to 60 different resource types that you need to discover. And then classification is really the process of attaching a criticality against each of those resources. Criticality being defined by confidentiality ratings, integrity ratings, and availability ratings. Now, this is a step that the, the automatic discovery of these resource types is something that Cavern actually uh, focuses on as the first step in this framework. The second step in this framework is really around assessing threats. So where might you get the data for threats? So our perspective of framework for doing this is really looking at threats from two, two uh, possible lenses, if you will. The first is the outside in view, which is uh, getting a sense from a threat, threat intelligence feeds perspective, what are the kinds of organizations that are actually targeting companies like you in, in, in specific verticals. And generally, the kinds of information that's available in threat intelligence feeds are outbreaks of malware or ransomware that target specific software flaws, if you will, uh, machines or IP addresses that have gone rogue. So for example, uh, if, uh, a lot of threat intelligence feeds can actually tell you if there are IP addresses that are, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that are actually suspect IP addresses that are used by hackers, if you will. And uh, you can see patterns of traffic from your infrastructure into those machines, if you will. A uh, dark web sensor really refers to your data re being leaked, your data, whether it's credit card data or any other kind of private data that's being leaked in the dark web. So there are products out there that can actually tell you that as well. Uh, and then vendor risk is another new, key, you know, new area that's coming up, which is suppliers or partners that you work with. Um, how risky are they when they connect to you online, if you will? That's what the vendor risk assessment are focusing on. So the outside in perspective, again, it's essentially looking at your organization from the outside and looking at the threats, uh, whether it's malware, ransomware, IP, you know, machines, or, you know, hosts that have gone rogue and so on. The inside out perspective is really more specific to your own infrastructure. And there, you know, the, the, the more reliable source of data that you might have in there are really the threat detection platforms. So for example, uh, if you have machines that are out there that are actually compromised, uh, these platforms can actually give you information. So uh, again, these are products that are focusing on behaviors that these machines are going through in terms of uh, files that they're accessing, IP addresses that they might be accessing, and then the behavior of the machines in terms of connections that they're making within the enterprise, if you will. So all of those are indicators of compromise, if you will, and threat detection platforms typically have that information. Another source of information are really your log and monitoring products or platforms. Splunk is the one that comes to mind for a number of customers. There again, uh, any analytics that you may have done in there uh, and alerts that you may have created from those analytics are things that you can actually leverage as part of threat detection. The next step is really uh, around figuring out what vulnerabilities you have in your, in your infrastructure and then what kind of controls you have in place. Broadly, the way we look at it is there are actually uh, three layers that you want to be aware of. One is your uh, cloud account and cloud services. That's the top layer. Containers is another second layer that you want to worry about. Uh, again, about uh, 25 to 30% of enterprises have containers in production. And to that extent, that's an attack surface that they should also worry about from the vulnerability and control assessment perspective. And then last but not least, the operating systems that are actually running all this infrastructure is also something that you want to worry about. Right? So the, the end game here is essentially looking for vulnerabilities across the stack, if you will, from cloud containers to the operating machines and virtual machines, operating systems and virtual machines, and then evaluating the controls you have in place. Controls typically are you know, what we call the four Ps. The four Ps are things like missing patches, ports being left open, the passwords, and then privilege escalations. Pretty much everything that you can think of in the uh, controls area falls into those four buckets, if you will. And that's what you're evaluating with respect to do you have those controls in place, and are you actually vulnerable to any of those, uh, any of those kinds of issues, if you will. 
And as it relates to determining likelihood, which is the, the confluence of those four circumstances, you're trying to figure out what's the likelihood. So how, what, what kind of data can you leverage to actually do that, right? So historical trends analysis is one, one source, like uh, organizations like you and your own data sets that you may have with respect to the kind of things that you've experienced over time is one source of input. Uh, vertical stats is another source of input. So for example, the uh, Verizon publishes a report every year which talks about certain, I think about uh, 12 or 15 industry verticals and the types of attacks that they typically encounter. So certain types of organizations like financial services or healthcare uh, tend to have certain types of attacks on them because they contain a lot of private information compared to, say, technology firms or other kinds of companies. So that, again, is a source of input for you to figure out any given threat, what's the likelihood of those threats coming to fruition for your particular set of circumstances. Taxi cadence is another interesting stat that you want to think about. The, the general uh, intuition there is that if you leave a patch, you, if you have a patch related vulnerability and you leave it unattended for more than let's say 60 days, then the likelihood of breach anecdotally or empirically is known to be nearly 100% at that point, right? So uh, when it comes to patching, uh, the longer you leave your system vulnerable to um, you know, software flaws, the more likely you are to get, get breached, and there is data around that that you can also leverage. And last but not least, everything that you saw on the previous slide, putting it all together in terms of how you can actually combine them, it will also help you estimate likelihood. The final dimension here is actually about estimating impact, if you will. Uh, as Anupam and I have both mentioned, it's about three dimensions. So the confidentiality of your data, for example, credit card data, social security numbers, and so on. Knowing that classification of data and systems that store them, that's one of the big, big inputs here. Uh, integrity has to do with uh, you know, data being made unusable. So ransomware attacks typically you know, get into that, leave your system in that type of state where data is unusable for you. And uh, there again, you, what you really want to think about is if the system or the uh, data in that system is unusable for a period of time, what's the impact on your business? And the unavailable system really refers to downtimes, you know, threats that cause downtime to you. So things like data or the packs and things like that are sort of in that territory, if you will. So the combination of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability is really what you want to think about when it comes to estimating your business impact. Again, whether you put a dollar value on it or whether you put a time dimension on it, that's something that you want to think about as part of this analysis. So putting it together, what you can see is that it's a fairly complicated analysis. So starting from resource or asset discovery and classification, evaluating threats through the outside in and inside out perspectives, doing assessments of your vulnerabilities and controls that you have in place, determining likelihood, which is again a four-dimensional problem as you see on the slide. And the last but not least, determining impact based on uh, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability ratings of your systems and data, if you will. You need to put them all together in one big engine and then come up with a size of the score, which is a number between a 0 and 100. Right? So in, in, in the demo that we'll do in, in a few minutes, I'll show you an example of how we actually manifest that in, uh, in, in real customer situations. I want to hand this back to Anupam at this point uh, before I give you to the demo. Thank you, Bashar. So yeah, so let's talk about an automated solution. Uh, Cavern has, has an automated solution for assessing your cyber posture intelligence for the hybrid cloud. And the way we do that is we discover all the resources in the hybrid cloud environment and give you the capability to protect monitor and, and remediate all these issues that are found so that you're able to maintain your target golden posture, which is really the desired cyber posture, and you're able to get there very quickly and, and be able to maintain it. So it's a complete uh, automated solution, very unique in the market. Uh, we announced a partnership with Verizon, as Bhashyam was mentioning, Verizon publishes a risk report every year, and, and Verizon is leveraging Cavern Cyber Posture to do an inside-out assessment of the risk exposure 
And um, that's been combined with a set of actions that customers, their customers need to take to ensure that they are able to understand where they stand today and then take steps towards getting to the golden posture. So in terms of where this is applicable, I talked about compliance related use cases, uh, DevOps scenarios, or um, hybrid cloud related uh, migration scenarios where you're moving resources from on-premises to the cloud, or you're switching from one cloud provider to the other, Cavern is able to give you that cyber posture score and, and, and you're able to stay on top of it. And, and this is a, an example dashboard of what, what Cavern provides. It gives you your contributions from the security side, from the compliance side that pro gives you an overall cyber posture score. In this case, a score of 17 has a lot of red because a number of issues are clearly unaddressed. And if you look at the middle pane here, it's telling you the top five issues that, that you need to focus on. So it's a completely interactive approach where, and personalized too, where you're able to understand what the top, top 10, 25, 50 issues are that you need to worry about, and, and we will give you a prioritized gap report so that you're able to, able to take action by minimizing the number of remedial actions or actions taken. There is a, we support about 25 plus control frameworks. These are a combination of configuration policy packs, what we call policy packs, or vulnerability related policy packs, or they could be security compliance related policy packs. So you can see a number of um, control frameworks from NIST that is supported, PCI, ISO, we support DISA, CIS, the configuration policy pack, we support patches and vulnerabilities. So as a customer, you're able to pick and choose the frameworks that you want to leverage, and, and then you set up the automation framework, protect, monitor, respond to make sure that you have real-time visibility into the cyber posture score and can take action to stay on top of it. Now, let me let, let us show you a quick demo and turn it over to Bhaskar to take us through a quick demo on, on the solution in action to, with the cyber posture score. Bhaskar? Thanks, Adam. So, um, so as one of them saying, uh, what we want to share here is to show a very quick five-minute demo in terms of a visualization of what actually cyber posture might look like for a CISO and the teams that work in the CISO's organization. So as we have hinted at uh, throughout this presentation, the overall view is that there is a company for whom we are trying to represent risk. So the cyber posture score, again, between 0 and 100 is what that number happens to be. And in our case, we are breaking it into security concerns versus compliance concerns, because both of those are important. And the idea here is that at the high-level CSOS perspective, the, the, uh, we, we give you two questions, answers to two questions. The first is, how am I doing from an overall security posture perspective? Again, a number between 0 and 100. That's an 82 in this particular case. How is the breakdown between security and compliance? So uh, I know who, go, who to go and talk to. And then last but not least, among the different layers or dimensions that, that are under my control, things like asset groups, which are like in this particular case, Mideast versus MEOs, Northwest, and so on. The idea here is that the CISO can very quickly drill down into, or drill, drill down and diagnose what's going on with, with respect to their cyber posture or security posture by groups, by environments, like GCP versus Docker versus AWS, and so on, by what we call policy packs or control frameworks. Um, and by operating systems, if you will, right? So the idea here is that very quickly from a high-level view, you have the ability to sort of drill down into any of those areas and figure out where, where your weaknesses are, right? So for example, you might decide when it comes to groups, there is something going on with my, uh, with my uh, let's say, the 55 score here, and you can actually drill into the 55. At that point, your breadcrumb changes, and then from, from that particular asset group, you can actually drill down further within that asset group. Uh, again, the asset group is, is a abstract concept in the Cavern platform, and it actually refers to some collection of resources 
that are managed by a set of individuals. So for example, geography could be one dimension to define an asset group. E-commerce versus in-house systems could be another dimension. Uh, cloud versus not cloud. All of these are examples of the ways that you might organize your assets, if you will. Right? So within North America, you might say that uh, I have a weak spot, for, for example, let's say in, in, in the Google Cloud assets that I have. And I can drill down further. And then I say that my HIPAA um, controls are probably the weakest in there. And I will drill down further like that. And, and more specifically, once I go into the HIPAA controls area, I know that my Red Hat environment is probably the one that's causing me the most grief. Right? So very quickly, I've answered two questions for you. The first is, how am I doing overall? And then helping you diagnose where my problem spots or weak spots are from a security and control perspective. Right, so that's so much for the CISO. Now, if you're a security analyst or a SecOps person, you probably want to go one level deeper. And for, for you, you probably want to, you're probably thinking about, okay, given the posture that I do have, um, you know, what are the kinds of things that I can work on from a remediation standpoint? So the, the widget that you see on the right-hand side here is actually telling you the top issues that are ranked by their impact on the cyber posture itself. So for example, you've got a bunch of things like a set of patches that are missing for, for some uh, critical software flaws, a few ports that are open, and so on. And the whole idea here is that of the thousands of things that could be wrong in your infrastructure, we focus, help you focus on the most important issues from the perspective of if you fix those issues, they have the most impact on your security posture. Right? And again, back to what Anupam led this webinar with, having a single score, a single unified score, helps you make those kinds of decisions from a prioritization perspective. Right? Similarly, um, the, we, we talked about managing to a golden posture. So in this case, uh, we have a target posture that is sort of the dream zone, that again, defined by a certain score. And based on the target posture, you can see you know, the kinds of gaps that you need to address. So for example, if you just define that I want my target posture to be between, let's say, 80 and 100, uh, you can actually get a list of issues that will help you improve your posture from wherever you are at the moment uh, to, let's say, an 80, right? So again, it's again an application of the top issues approach, but more oriented towards hitting a golden posture. And, and that, again, is something that you can do, do through this interface, right? Uh, a few things that you also want to worry about is if you have alerts that are defined by the different uh, threat platforms that I discussed a little bit earlier, uh, you can also see them in the single view, if you will. And the last but not least, if you're some sort of an analyst that wants to slice and dice the data in many different ways, uh, you have sort of a filter panel on the left-hand side that lets you do that. Right? Uh, and so you can check off one or more groups, a few environments, and then hit the Apply button. And based on those combinations, you get a sense for how you're doing from a security, security posture perspective for that combination of things. One last thing, which uh, I don't have a demo just as yet, but from the issues area, uh, you can actually start a remediation workflow, if you will. Now, in, in the Cabin product, you can, uh, so as you can see, there are these icons that are not activated just as yet. But there are two kinds of things that you can do from a remediation perspective. The first, you simply uh, notifying someone through a work management system like Jira or ServiceNow. So you can send those notifications uh, along with pager duty and Slack. Right? So that's the most basic kind of thing uh, that you can do for any of the issues that are hurting your cyber posture. Another kind of uh, remediation that we're working towards is really uh, taking one of these issues and creating a chef or Ansible label, which you can then publish or push out uh, to your infrastructure to remediate. Right? So that's, or or uh, the AWS Lambda and similar serverless technologies are also uh, have a play there with respect to remediating issues as you find them. The general idea here is that you have a single pane of glass. We call it the dashboard, from which a CISO can address top-level questions and represent cyber posture and risk to the C-level and the board boardroom. They, they get that, that, that view. A SecOps person knows what to work on from a top issue perspective. And then an analyst can go and slice and dice the uh, cyber posture itself, the cyber posture score itself, along the dimensions that they care about. So let me pause there and hand it back to Anupam to wrap up. Thank you, Bhashyam. So let's just uh, 
conclude some of the things that we learned today. So in terms of conclusions, um, clearly the hybrid cloud security topic is, is very uh, complex because of the, all the topics that I talked about. And being able to do risk analysis in that environment, complex environment, is, is even tougher. So what, what is required is an automated tool that can do that cyber posture assessment for you and help you manage your cyber posture as things change. Security by its very nature is dynamic. It changes. And, and because constantly threats are evolving, the threat actors are changing, and, uh, and your requirements are changing. So it's important to automate the process. Manual assessments only give you a snapshot in time. What you need is a continuous assessment that allows you to stay on top of it. And clearly knowing the cyber posture score is, we believe, very critical for for you to understand as a first step where you stand today, what's the health of your current infrastructure, and, and then if you know that, then you can take remedial steps to minimize the chances of cyber breach or violation of corporate compliance policies. So our question that we would like to leave you with is, what's the cyber posture IQ intelligence with respect to where you stand today? With that, let me pause here. And, and see whether there are any questions from the audience that we can we can take today. Anupam, I don't see any. Uh, so Anupam, Basham, thank you very much um, for the, your uh, you know knowledge sharing today. I think it was really great content. Once again, for those listening on the line, uh, visit us on our website, uh, cavern.com, to learn more about cyber posture scoring and also for a link to the recording of the webinar today. So everyone online, have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.